Welcome everyone. This is a webinar uh, around the management of data and information in research guide and the related code of the, um, for the responsible conduct of research. I'm uh, Adrian Burton. We'll also have uh, Justin with us from the ARC. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respect to the elders past and present. Over the last couple of years, the authors of the, the co-authors of the Guide for the Responsible Conduct of Research, that's Universities Australia, NHMRC and ARC, have been updating the code and uh, bringing out a series of guides uh, related to the code. In our uh, fairly, uh, mostly uh, unregulated or self-regulated, the self-regulated system that we have for research in Australia, this doc policy document is the sort of peak statement about uh, research integrity and the updating of the code and the um, related guides is a, a very important um, development in the research sector. So uh, the ARDC is facilitating a number of uh, webinars uh, around uh, this change and particularly we are focusing in on the uh, guide to the management of data and information. So today we have uh, a series of events. Today's event is really to familiarise ourselves with the changes uh, in both the code and the related uh, data guide, which is the abbreviation I'll use. Uh, so it's really to get a, uh, an idea of what the, ch what the changes are and, you know, have a clear idea of what the uh, responsibilities of researchers and research organisations are in this area. So that will be today's uh, event and we'll have Justin talk, uh, briefing us about that. Tomorrow and next week we have two workshops which are having established you know what data management you know what the responsibilities and roles of different actors uh, are. Uh, we'll have two workshops to exchange information about what good data management practices are and and what experience uh, the uh, institutions have had in uh, implementing those. So there's one workshop tomorrow uh, targeted at universities and there's one uh, in exactly one week's time for the MRIs. Today we've got uh, Mr Justin Withers, who's the Director of Access International and Integrity at the Australian Research Council, who will be giving us a background to the uh, changes and the uh, new content of the code and the related data guide. Justin. Thanks, Adrian. Um, what I'll do now is I'll share my screen uh, and we'll get rolling. So hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, so let's get moving. All right. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about primarily um, funders' expectations in relation, relation to data management. Uh, that'll be focusing on um, the data management guide uh, in a lot of detail. But I'd also like to take the opportunity to just set the scene um, about the research funding landscape in Australia. Um, talk briefly about the development of the new version of the uh, Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research, which was released in 2018. Um, also, uh, I've got a slide on the National Statement on Ethical Conduct in Human Research, uh, which is uh, part of the suite of documents and guides that are in place to support and underpin the ethical conduct of research in Australia. Um, uh, and then following on from the data guide where I'll talk about responsibilities of institutions um, and also of researchers. I'll also touch on um, ARC and NHMRC expectations 
regarding the, the management uh, and access of data that's produced as a result of um, our funding. So um, Australian government investment in uh, R&D the last financial year was uh, $9.6 billion um, across a variety of portfolios. Um, it's quite a unique funding system here in Australia where the delivery of R&D funds is, is quite diverse um, through uh, a number of portfolios, including industry, uh, education, health, defence, uh, and other agencies such as uh, environment uh, and agriculture. Um, of the, the funding that's delivered, the $9.6 billion, uh, that's directly related to the Australian Code. There is uh, about $800 million that comes from the ARC and an equivalent amount of money that is delivered through NHMRC. Um, and part of the, uh, the requirements for receiving that funding is an explicit adherence to the Code uh, and its supporting documentation. So that is included in all of the ARC and NHMRC guidelines and funding rules. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, um, I'll just touch on the purpose and key activities of the ARC, uh, and then likewise the same for the NHMRC. Um, so ARC has been around in one shape or form for quite some time, but in its current form, um, there was some legislation introduced in 2001, the ARC Act, um, which basically sets out um, what the responsibilities of the ARC are, um, and they're delivered through three key activities. Um, key activity one is funding the highest quality research. Um, activity two is assessing the quality and engagement impact of research delivered through Australian universities. Uh, and also we provide advice to um, the government on science and research matters. Um, we're part of the education portfolio, uh, and as a result, we report directly to the Minister for Education. Yeah, the NHMRC, um, I like to refer them to them as our sister agency. We work uh, very closely and, and, and hand in glove with each other. The ARC funds all disciplines, um, including the very basic side of biology and um, medical research. Uh, but all clinical research is delivered through the NHMRC, whose budget is slightly larger than ours. Um, and their three key um, missions are, and themes are investing in high quality health and medical research um, to build research capability uh, uh, within Australia, um, supporting the translation of health and medical research into clinical practice, uh, and also maintaining a strong integrity framework for research and guideline development. Um, to underpin uh, rigorous research practices in Australia. Um, so whilst uh, the ARC and HMRC and UA are co-authors of the code and a number of other accompanying documents, um, the Secretariat support and the driver for the, the development of that information is generally rests with the NHMRC. Um, at the moment, they're also delivering uh, a number of programs under the Medical Research Future Fund, uh, which was established in 2015. It's a $20 billion perpetual fund where the uh, interest earned on that investment uh, is drawn down uh, and, and direct, directed towards strategic health-related research. And a lot of those schemes are delivered through NHMRC whilst they're managed primarily through the Department of Health. Um, a couple of years ago, NHMRC also went through uh, a bit of a, a revisit and a review of the way they deliver their funding. Um, and came up with uh, a revised funding stream of uh, four main streams, investigator grants, synergy grants, ideas grants, and strategic and leveraging grants. So they cover off various aspects of medical research through those grants. So the next slide looks at the framework for the responsible conduct of research. Um, I'll get rid of all these bubbles. Someone who did this for me didn't tell me they were flying in like that. But anyway, um, so central to the framework is the code, um, the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research, uh, and it's central to um, our research integrity framework. Um, it's been in place, uh, known as the code, since 2007. There was a previous document, but before that, uh, penned in 96 um, by the Australian Vice Chancellor's Committee, um, but it, it took on its name of the Australian Code uh, in 2007. And it was revised again in 2000, oh, 
uh, released in 2018 after a couple of years of revision. So I'd like to emphasize here that research integrity in Australia is a shared responsibility. Um, so the ARC and NHMRC as the two largest government funders of competitive grants have worked with UA to develop the code and supporting documents. Um, research institutions themselves um, have primary responsibility for maintaining research and integrity and ensuring the concerns about potential breaches of the code are appropriately addressed. Um, so the code is supported by other codes and statements, um, including uh, the national statement, statement, which covers research with human subjects. Um, there's also supporting documentation regarding research with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and communities. Uh, and also AATSIS has just released um, a revised code on research involving, involving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples and communities. And that part is part of the, the system of research integrity underpinning the responsible research in Australia. Um, ARC and HMRC funding guidelines and funding agreements require compliance with the code and the other codes and statements as a condition of funding. So the research that we do fund are legally obliged to adhere to the principles in these documents. Um, as well as these, uh, as the codes and documents, NHMRC and ARC also have policies in place, uh, research integrity policies that require institutions to report relevant breaches of the code to us uh, and also provide mechanisms for our organisations to apply actions and consequential actions in response of breaches to the code. So it's basically opens up a line of communication for us to um, be across um, research integrity issues uh, at universities. Uh, it makes the system transparent, particularly to us, given that we are providing a fair amount of the support for that research. Um, now, given that uh, research integrity in Australia is uh, primarily a self-managed system where institutions themselves are responsible for, I guess, investigating themselves, there's an avenue of appeal um, to make sure that those processes are all above board, and that is the Australian Research Integrity Committee. So they're designed to assure um, integrity through its review functions. Um, so if someone has concerns about the procedural fairness uh, and the way in which institutions have investigated issues, they can put in an ARIC request for review. Um, and another element of this quality framework is, uh, is TEXA, uh, the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency. Um, it's an independent national quality assurance and regulatory agency for higher education. Um, and all institutions that are uh, given the status of universities have to comply with, um, with, with TEXA's requirements. Um, you may have noticed recently they're looking to expand their remit a little bit and have included a integrity unit um, to look at uh, a high level research integrity compliance um, at institutions as well. Uh, and NHMRC and UA, and UA and ARC are working closely with TEXA to make sure that there's no overlap between the responsibilities that we deliver uh, for research integrity and what TEXA is planning. Um, so, as I've alluded to before, the code underpins the framework for responsible kind of research in Australia, it's central to that. Um, and in 2018, the latest version of this code was released. Um, it's been co-authored again by ARC, NHMRC and UA. Um, and essentially, the version we have now builds on the 2007 version. Um, it's a, a tight and more compact document. Um, and it's presented in a more simpler way, um, designed to support high quality research, enhance credibility of research and promote community trust in research. Um, by, no, by no means do we think that the code has been diluted by um, its uh, short and condensed version uh, into a principle based document, um, because I'm, as I'm about to speak to shortly, um, there are a whole lot of series of guides uh, with detail that was in the previous 2007 version that can provide assistance to institutions and researchers in meeting their requirements of the code. Um, so the code is now a principle based document. Um, there are eight principles of research integrity uh, and there's 29 responsibilities associated with those um, that institutions and researchers need to adhere to and be re <coughs> responsible for. Um, so I won't go into 
too much detail regarding the actual responsibilities, apart from those related to data management, which I'll cover later. Um, but the the key, the code's eight principles are honesty uh, in the development, undertaking and reporting of research, rigour in the development, undertaking and reporting of research, transparency in declaring interests and reporting research methodology, data and findings, um, fairness in the treatment of others, uh, respect for research participants, the wider community, animals and the environment, recognition of the right of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to be engaged in research that affects or is of particular significance to them, accountability for the development, undertaking and reporting of research and the promotion of responsible research practices. So these eight principles inform the 29 responsibilities that apply for institutions of which there's 13 and 16 responsibilities for individual researchers. Uh, so some of these responsibilities relate to only one of the, uh, the eight principles, uh, others um, relate to multiple. So as I read through those principles, you probably would have picked up, there's a few that uh, could uh, either directly or loosely relate to data management um, practice and integrity. So as I said, the 2018 version of the code um, hasn't been watered down at all. It's been tightened. Uh, and if you look at it in its entirety with the, uh, the supporting guides that have been put in place to underpin those, uh, the principle-based code, um, there is a lot more detail and detail that's presented in a, uh, a, a guidance, a, a way to guide uh, institutions and researchers to meet those principles. So um, those guides include, of course, um, the investigation guide, which was released at the same time as the code. So that uh, outlines how institutions should address um, allegations of breaches of the code and they should go about investigating those uh, uh, and being procedurally fair about doing that. Um, and then the old version of the code in 2007 had a series of chapters at the front. A lot of those related to various elements of research undertaking. And now these are represented in these guides. So I'll be speaking in some detail about the data guide, but there's also a guide on authorship, uh, one on supervision, peer review, disclosure of interests, uh, collaborations, publication and dissemination of research, and, and also, as I've mentioned already, uh, the investigation guide. Um, now these guides are really prescriptive. Uh, this is keeping with their character as guidance documents. I'd also recognise that under Australia's self-regulated system, it is institutions that must ultimately be responsible for their policies and procedures for ensuring that they are consistent with the code. So they are, they're not written in blood, so to speak. Institutions need to apply these, these guidance material to their own policies and requirements they put in place for their, for their researchers. So as I said earlier on, there's a number of, of the, uh, the principles that sort of relate directly to to data management, um, and I've drawn those out here in this slide. Uh, principle two, uh, rigour in the development, undertaking and reporting of research, which requires that research be characterised by attention to detail and robust methodology, and that research is avoid or acknowledge biases. Uh, principle three, transparency in declaring interests and reporting research methodology, data and findings, which requires researchers to share and communicate research methodology, data and findings openly, responsibly and accurately. And principle seven, accountability for the development, undertaking and reporting of research so as to comply with relevant legislation, policies, guidelines and ensure good stewardship of public resources used to conduct research. Now, I mentioned earlier on, um, before I go into the exact the, the, the details of, res of researchers and institutions, um, the national statement um, on ethical conduct in human research, uh, most recently updated in 2018, does have some specific requirements uh, regarding data. So section three of the national statement provides guidance on ethical considerations in the design, development, review and conduct of research. Um, it provides specific and detailed guidance on the collection, use and management of data and information. Uh, for human-based research, and it addresses particularly ethical issues related to generation, collection, access, use, uh, an analysis, storage, and retention of the data of this information that in many cases can be very sensitive. 
Uh, it also requires the development of a data management plan um, as a specific requirement in the national statement. And I'll talk a bit more about uh, ARC expectations regarding data management plans later on. So now, the data guide. Uh, this guide was released in June 2019. Um, in essence, this was about the same time that the, uh, the 2018 version of the code came into force. Whilst it was released in 2018, we gave institutions a year's grace to be able to put in place the necessary policies and supporting information for their researchers and before it became uh, in place in June, July 2019. Um, so it guides and assists institutions and researchers to adhere to the relevant principles of the code. Um, it was one of the first guides released, um, recognising the central role uh, of the subject matter to research endeavour. Um, so critically, best practice data and information management facilitates the justification and verification of the outcomes of research. It maximises the potential for future research and minimises waste of resources of value to researchers and the wider community. The guidance in the data guide corresponds directly to multiple responsibilities of the code. It specifically references the following institutional responsibilities. Uh, responsibility four, um, institutions are, are required to provide ongoing training and education. Uh, responsibility five, uh, ensure supervis supervisors of research trainees have the appropriate skills, qualifications and resources. And responsibility eight, provide access to facilities for the safe and secure storage and management of research data, records and primary materials. And this is important uh, given the current appetite worldwide uh, and, and within the Australian government uh, to allow access uh, as openly as possible. Um, as well as uh, the specific following uh, researcher responsibility, responsibility 22 is to retain clear, accurate, secure and complete records of all research, including research data and primary materials. And as I alluded to earlier on, where possible and appropriate, allow access and reference to these by interested parties. As I mentioned earlier, the guides are rarely prescriptive. The data guide is no exception. Instead, providing institutions with what might more accurately be described as a checklist of relevant considerations for inclusion in institutional policies, along with some limited instances of some very specific guidance. For example, of this specific guidance, uh, under the category of storage, retention and disposal, the data guide alerts institutions to the fact that research data should be consistent with any copyright or licensing arrangements, uh, be in accord with research discipline, specific practices and standards, comply with relevant privacy, ethical and publication requirements, and comply with other relevant laws. Um, now, the specific the specificity of the guide also includes prescribed data retention periods. Um, so I bring those to your attention. Uh, for short-term research projects that are for assessment purposes only, such as research projects conducted by students, um, retaining research data for 12 months after the completion of the research project may be sufficient. For most clinical trials, however, retaining research data for 15 years or more may be necessary. Um, for areas such as gene therapy, research data must be retained permanently. And if the work has community, cultural, historical value, research data should be kept permanently, preferably with a, within a national collection. Uh, so the responsibility of institutions uh, are to develop and implement policies uh, and provide facilities and processes. Um, the policy should include guidance for managing research data and primary, primary materials that address the following. Ownership, stewardship and control, storage, retention and disposal, safety, security and confidentiality, access by interested parties. Uh, policy should apply to all research conducted under the auspices of the institution and may be influenced by the funding arrangements for the project in particular. Um, so, some other responsibilities of institutions include training. 
training and education may assist researchers and others in relevant roles to follow not only the institution's data management policies, but also other relevant disciplinary specific policies. Um, in relation to ownership, stewardship and control of research data and primary materials, um, just emphasising uh, with respect to ownership of data information used or in or generated by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research and communities, institutions or researchers may hold data. However, they should not make decisions about the access or re reuse of this data without proper consultation with the Indigenous owners. Um, institutional policy shouldn't be designed to unnecessarily impede the normal use of research data and primary materials by researchers. Um, so basically they should be in place to facilitate access and use rather than impede access and use. Um, storage, retention and disposal. Retaining the research data is important because it may be that all remains of the research work at the end of the project. So the storage, retention, disposal of research data should be consistent with any copyright or licensing arrangements, um, be in accord with discipline, discipline specific practices, comply with relevant policy and comply with other relevant laws, regulations and guidelines. Um, and one of the, uh, the key concerns about researchers is, is data safety uh, and, and access and ownership. Um, so the policy should also assist researchers in um, informing them of relevant confidentiality agreements and restrictions on the use of research data, um, ensure that computing systems are secure, um, ensure that IT personnel understand their responsibilities for network security access control, and ensure that those holding primary material, including electronic material, understand their responsibilities. So there's a big role in training uh, those with access to, to research data, as well as those that generate it, to ensure um, the safety and security of that data. Um, as I said earlier on, with the open science, open research agenda, access by interested parties is also extremely important. Um, so the policy should describe how to make research data available to interested parties um, and also provide a license so people can at a glance understand how that data can be used and reused. Um, where sharing of research data has been requested and access has been refused, the reasons for not sharing the data should be transparent and justifiable. Um, so if you've got a research project involving um, a uh, private investment uh, for a, a company or industry um, and that data produced from that research project uh, is, uh, is um, owned by the, the, uh, the company rather than the researcher, there's a justifiable reason why that shouldn't be made openly accessible. Um, institutions also should look to provide facilities. So research data controlled by the institution and its researchers should be stored in facilities provided by or approved by the institution. So there's a big role there for institutions to put in place um, systems and databases where researchers can um, store, use, access and manage their data. So I know there's a fair few universities out there that have been doing a lot of work recently in providing that sort of uh, <coughs> that data data service for their researchers, including uh, uh, a couple of spring to mind, uh, University of Queensland, Tasmania and um, UTS in Sydney are, are three that I'm more familiar with. But I understand that there's a lot of universities there are taking that responsibility very seriously and providing facilities uh, and support for the uh, the safe storage and access of data. Um, so the moving on to the responsibilities of individual researchers. Um, researchers should adhere to the institutional policies. Okay, the policies are there in place to support and guide the researchers. Um, and those policies, of course, um, cover off on, as I've said, the management, uh, of data, the relevant laws, the regulations and guidelines and research discipline, discipline specific practices and standards that apply to those in individual researchers. Um, uh, a data management plan should also be developed early in the research process for researchers. Um, Durable records derived from them, such as assays, test results, transcripts, and lab laboratory and field notes must be retained and accessible as well. Um, so 
the data guide responsibilities for research uh, relates specifically to what's on the slide here, retention and publication. So individual researchers, of course, have primary responsibility for deciding which research data and primary materials is for long-term retention and wider accessibility. So that's a, a judgment call by individual researchers themselves. Um, researchers should also manage confidential and other sensitive material um, appropriately um, and exercise care in handling confidential or other sensitive information used or in or arising from a research project. Um, institutions are required to provide the training, but uh, researchers are responsible for ensuring that they engage with this relevant training. Um, and uh, another responsibility for researchers is to acknowledge the use of others' data in their research. Uh, and they should do that by appropriately referencing and citing the work of others in the presentation publication or sharing of research. So in essence, the responsibility rests with institutions to put in some systems and, uh, and policies to assist their researchers as well as storage facilities, etc. But a lot of the onus on appropriately managing that research data about how it should be um, accessed uh, and reused and cited rests with individual researchers themselves. Um, but institutions should also be able to provide support for those decision-making processes. Um, so the ARC um, has long been cognizant of the value of research data. Uh, and whilst we don't have a specific policy in place, we do have a data statement uh, and also have some provisions in our funding rules and grant agreements. Um, that specify our expectations regarding the management of data. Um, so these requirements are designed to encourage researchers to consider the ways in which they can best manage, store, disseminate and re reuse their data. Um, data management planning from the beginning of a project helps to guide how data will be collected, uh, formatted, described, stored, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important that researchers from the very beginning of their research project or even the research concept are thinking about what data is going to be generated and how they will manage that data. Um, so as a co-author of the code, uh, we're committed to uh, effective data management. And um, again, underpinned by ensuring open access to um, publicly funded research data whenever possible. Um, some institutions may have infrastructure and processes in place of storing, managing and sharing data, um, and these are valuable resources that should be utilised. So since February 2014, we have required researchers to consider how they plan, manage and research data arising from ARC funded research. Um, and originally we asked in applications that um, researchers give a, a brief synopsis of um, how they'll manage their research data. Um, that uh, recently evolved to, um, rather than requiring that at the, at the application stage, um, we require all funded research projects to have in place a data management plan prior to the commencement of the project. Um, and this forms, this is part of requirement in the funding agreement now. So this slide here um, explains the, the expectations. So around data management plans, um, it's uh, at the moment for ARC funding agreements from 2020, it's in section A2, 2.5. Um, institution researchers and participating organisations have an obligation to collect and maintain research data in accordance with the 2018 code. Um, it must be developed prior to the commencement of the project. It should be consistent with the requirements contained in the 2018 code and the data guide. Uh, and the data management plan should be compatible with disciplinary standards and how participants will manage the long-term preservation of data arising from the funded projects, including but not limited to storage, access and reuse arrangements. And we also strongly encourage that data arising from the project is deposited in a appropriately publicly accessible discipline or institutional repository. And you must maintain 
you must retain your data management plan and make it available to the ARC if it's requested. So we're not asking to see every one of these data management plans, um, but we do have undertake institutional reviews uh, occasionally. And often the questions are, we're looking at compliance with our funding agreements. And if a project was identified to have a closer look at, we'd expect that it would have a data management plan in place. Um, as I've said before, we encourage uh, researchers to deposit data arising from a project in a public accessible repository. Now this has been in place since 2007. Um, and in fact, it was a requirement in the 2007 version of the code. Um, where researchers can't meet this requirement, reasons need to be provided in our final report. Um, and as I said earlier on, we don't have a specific mandate or, or policy in relation to this. Um, and this is in reflection of the, the challenges uh, involved in addressing the rapid growth and changes occurring in relation to data and also the very large variances in the types of data that are generated from ARC funded research. So it's not necessarily a one size fits all. Um, we also actively monitor the international landscape and what's occurring there. Um, and we are actively engaged with, uh, with the number of players within Australian system, including ARDC, the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group, CALL and others. Um, and uh, as an example, I'm a participant on the Fair Access Steering Group uh, that's findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, um, which is an ongoing committee established under the Deputy Vice Chancellor's Research Committee at UA. Um, so NHMRC's expectations aren't too different than the ARC's. Um, they also acknowledge the importance of making research data publicly accessible. Um, they strongly encourage researchers to consider the reuse value of their data and take responsibility, responsible steps to share research data and associated metadata. Um, now, part of their expectations are that researchers should ensure that appropriate metadata accompanies the data sets so people can at a glance understand what the detail is in those data sets. Um, and they also must consider the appropriate level of access. Um, um, rather than specifying a data management plan is in place in their funding agreements, NHMRC funding agreements requires that all research metadata arising from the project must be listed in the final report for each project. So that's about it from me. Um, Happy to take some questions and I'll throw back to Adrian to facilitate those. Um, I did get a few questions earlier on that people had sent through, so I might cover off on those now before I throw to Adrian. Um, I've had a question here. Different research fields have orders of magnitude differences in data volume. Will funders support storage of the, later, of the larger volumes in budgets? Um, not necessarily. Um, the ARC, um, uh, budget is a one line budget um, and whilst the uh, the decision on whether the research project is funded is primarily on the excellence of that project, um, there is um, some provisions for this dissemination of research. So uh, individual researchers or research teams could consider the value in directing some of that funding towards um, data retention uh, and access, um, but primarily the responsibility for storing large scale uh, volume of data is it rests with the institutions. Um, there's a question regarding the expectations around FAIR uh, principles for genomic databases. Um, I can't really answer that question um, given I'm not from NHMRC and we don't fund that, that type of research necessarily here. Um, but I would uh, point to the fact that uh, there needs to be a consideration of the, uh, the safety and security of the information and people's privacy. Um, so um, it's really a case by case situation. Um, and that's all part of the, the process of developing and considering a data management plan that uh, undertake, that is, looks, looks to uh, look at um, access arrangements uh, and reusability. Um, 
And how will we support questions on the data management guide on an ongoing basis? Um, well, I think if you email um, the ARC or NHMRC directly, we can look to provide some further advice regarding specific questions. Um, whilst there, but although there are, you know, the onus is primarily on institutions, um, we are happy to provide some advice and consistent advice where we can. Um, I think the ARC is also a very valuable resource to do that. Another question, how should researchers interpret principle 22 to retain clear, accurate, secure and complete records? Uh, it's particularly in disciplines where enormous data volumes make it impractical and impossible to store or complete research data. Um, the key point there is where possible. So it's if, if an institution or a researcher has, uh, and there's no real value in retaining the whole data set, there needs to be a record of um, the the uh, the data that supports the research output or the publication. So um, in, in, in cases where there's massive data sets that can't be accessed or stored um, easily, um, there's no responsibility at this stage to make all those accessible. But if you're publishing, you need to make sure that the, the data underpinning that research is available uh, for those to, uh, to check. Um, So is there any obligation or responsibility regarding the management of data and information facilities such as NCRES that support and enable researchers or does the guide only apply to host institutions? Um, basically, at the moment, the code and the guide uh, apply to any research that's funded by the NHMRC and ARC. I do know that um, some of the publicly funded research agencies such as CSIRO and ANSTO are also requiring adherence to um, the principles in the code, um, and I know that they do manage some NCRES facilities. So uh, I think there is uh, a loose expectation that um, the code and the guide itself can apply to broader, um, broader research uh, endeavours in Australia outside those which are funded by ARC and HMRC. But um, specifically at this stage, it's only that research which is funded by us. Um, that is uh, noted in funding agreements uh, and, the, and, the, and the code itself. So thank you for your attention. Um, I'll hand back to Adrian now uh, and uh, we can facilitate some more questions and discussion if needed. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Justin. That's a really great overview of some very key documents there. Um, all right, well, I'll go through some of these questions. Uh, remembering that we have two more workshops to address kind of the implementation questions of data management at institutions. And uh, I also note that uh, in within the question, the chat, uh, part of our, our objective here was to set up forums in which the different the sector can exchange information and that's been happening wildly in the chat where some people have already chipped in and uh, given their own experience. I'll try and sift through some of these questions that are mostly about the actual phrasing of the code itself uh, and if we don't get to all of them then we'll pass them on to Justin and we'll be able to uh, either address them at the, at the coming workshops or uh, privately. There were a couple of questions uh, towards the beginning about, um, I'll read one of them out here. Is the requirement to have proper storage facilities something that can be shared between institutions? Yeah, there's no reason why it can't, um, you know, particularly for you know, big massive data sets that are, that are generated by um, collaborative research. Um, it really depends on the sort of arrangements and negotiations that are put in place between institutions, but there's no reason. Look, we don't want uh, duplication of, of big data sets. There's no, no reason in, in, for that to occur. Um, but as the NHMRC has pointed out, sometimes all you need is some metadata that uh, signposts the uh, existence of the large data set which, and where it can be found. And that doesn't necessarily have to be within um, a single institution. Another question, uh similar but not quite the same. 
In a situation where you have researchers working for various institutes and they're nested into a collaborative entity, where does the primary responsibility for adherence to the code sit? Well, good practice would mean that there's a, a data management plan in place at the start of the project and that data management plan would um, be based on um, an agreement or negotiations between all players. Um, generally speaking though, if uh, from the ARC perspective, if the administering organisation, that's the organisation that's applied for and won the funding uh, and would be managing a larger project on the basis of other players, the responsibility for you know, data management, et cetera, would rest with that, with, with that institution. Um, but the data management plan could specify particular nuances about how the data is managed and accessed. But there's a couple of questions about sort of compliance and spot checks. So I'll read out one or two of those. Does the ARC or an NHMRC ever do proactive spot check audits or is it only based on alleged breaches? Um, as I said a little later in my presentation, we do have a, a system of institutional visits or reviews as we call them. So we generally visit two, sometimes up to four institutions a year on a, a sort of a, a rolling basis. Um, it used to be called an audit, but you know, it's not really that formal. We will come out and look at, um, as part of that process, look at a number of projects that have been undertaken by the institution, uh, making sure that they conform with with the the, uh, the funding agreement and uh, requirements. And as of 2020, of course, there needs to be a data management plan in place before that project can start. So I would think that um, that one of the questions asked moving forward would be for those projects to look at can you please show me your data management plan before the project started? Um, as far as potential breaches of, um, of the code and the guide regarding data, um, we aren't necessarily, or we're not considered an investigative body. Um, as I mentioned, it's a self-regulated system. So it's a case of either self-reporting or if there are instances of potential breaches of the code regarding data and someone reports that to us either openly or um, anonymously, we will uh, look at do a bit of due diligence to see whether there's any merit in that uh, allegation and then we will refer it on to the institution to investigate themselves. Um, and our policies specify that if we do so, they need to report back within a 12 week window um, on the outcomes of their preliminary assessment um, as to whether or not there's been a, a, um, a breach of the code in relation to data management. And there was another question about the repercussions of a breach, but I think what you're saying there is that then the, the uh, consequences are put in place by the institutions themselves, is that correct? No, no, well, that's the, the institutions themselves will, will look at the, the issue and the allegation and determine whether there's a breach of the code and, in essence, the severity of that breach. Um, institutions can use, can, can uh, apply the term research misconduct they want to, but, but uh, we recognise in the guide and the investigation guide and their policies that um, Breaches of the code occur on a spectrum from being minor and inadvertent to um, systemic or planned um, fraud or integrity breaches, uh, which for all intensive purposes is research misconduct, whether you label it or not. Um, so once we're advised of the outcomes of the institution's consideration, we will look at it on its merits and we will determine from our perspective whether we need to apply a sanction or a control um, ranging from um, maybe asking for a double certification uh, for that researcher for a couple of years regarding data management when they apply for funding, all the way through to ceasing their access to ARC funding for a number of years and recalling the, the grant amount from the institution. So it's a case of working closely with institutions and of course, institutions themselves, if they want, can apply their own sanctions to that researcher as well. But we will look specifically on the impact of the, the project from an ARC perspective the potential damage to the ARC reputation and act accordingly. 
Great. Uh, there's a question about uh, the data retention periods and the potential for there to be um, inconsistency or, or, or just not the same data retention period required by, let's say, there's an example of a state government requirement and potentially the federal requirement and other uh, retention requirements of different institutions, perhaps. Um, just the, uh, the questions, you know, it's really an observation that there seems to be the opportunity for a disparity. Yeah, look, and I said that the guides, it's, it's a guide. Um, it's not written in law. I know although there are some specific reference periods that are strongly suggested, um, the, the ones that I went through about genomics data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also I kept going to the point that in relation to the management of data, you also need to give consideration to other legislation and, and requirements as well. So you need to look holistically at that. Um, and I think from an ARC and HMRPC perspective, if you meet the, the, the minimum requirements that we've specified in the guide, it's not too much of a problem. And I, like, I'm sorry, I can't give you a straight answer on that, but it's a guidance material only. Institutions are there are able to interpret that and what they expect their researchers to adhere to. And in doing so, institutions would also give reference, I think, to their state legislation requirements as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, good, let me just go uh, down here. We haven't got a lot of time, so just a couple more questions here. Just, and again, skip over some of the ones that might be implementation stuff that uh, can be covered in the other, in the uh, workshops. Um, have a look here. I think we've covered that one. Does the LDC do spot checks? In situations where you have researchers working, no, we've already done that one. Um, appraisal and sentencing of research data is actually one of the most difficult aspects. Who should make the final call on appraisal and therefore retention period? Now, I'm sure we'll get into this tomorrow, but is there anything uh, specific from the code point of view, do you think, Justin? No, look, not, nothing specific, but I think it's all part of the, of the process that there needs to be some decisions and considera some consideration uh, of these issues prior to the commencement of the project uh, involving all players and institutions should be there to, I guess, provide some assistance. Um, you know, the ARDC also, I mean, part of its education um, remit too is to provide some, I guess, some assistance in, in some of those considerations as well. Good. Now I might get on to some of the more um, practical ones as we're coming right to the end here. Uh, the will the slides be shared? Yes, you can make this. Um, I think AOC will make the slides um, available afterwards. Yep, not a problem. We'll make them available from the ARDC website. Uh, will the record, is it being recorded? Will the recording be made available? Yes, we will make the recording available uh, in on the ARDC website as well. Just checking any others here. Not sure that we've got any others. Uh, one last question here. All universities adhere to the code. They must, they must, but they don't always. In fact, quite often is the observation. <laughs> Have policies or procedures for data management or data storage. Let me start again. All universities adhere to the code. They must, but they don't always. In fact, quite often have policies or procedures for data management or data storage and don't provide infrastructure for data storage. Does it mean all the responsibilities fall on the researchers? No, no. Institutions are required to have um, policies in place at a bare minimum um, and the support infrastructure. So look, I think some universities have been well prepared uh, historically and supporting their researchers in this space. 
Um, but moving forward, you know, there is the expectation and requirement that these, these support mechanisms and policies are in place at institutions. Um, we have one of the reasons that we, you know, the guide was released in 2018 but didn't come into force into 2019 um, was the need for institutions to prepare themselves for the, for the suite of policies. Um, often institutions too have um, shared arrangements um, in relation to or can in relation to storage uh, of data and management of data. Um, but what I'm in saying in short is no, the responsibility for researchers are to adhere to the code, um, but any uh, possible shortcomings in their respect would be considered contextually in, in the support that's provided by institutions as well. Good, thank you very much, Justin. That's really nice of you to have uh, allocated the time. Um, I think, uh, so on behalf of the audience, consider a very, very loud clap at the moment. Thank you very much for giving us all that information, Justin, and clarifying it with questions as well. Um, and I'd also look at, I encourage, and I understand, I think most of you guys are from research offices. Um, I think it's really important that um, you share um, information and ideas with each other. Um, there are some particular groups in place that do so already. Um, and I know that working with, the, with those people in those groups, they are very, very open to, to providing assistance to others uh, and ensuring you know, a consistent um, approach in supporting and underpinning the research integrity effort in Australia. So um, I think these forums are, are fantastic opportunities to, to make some of these links uh, if you haven't done so already. Um, and, I'm always, always willing to um, take questions and hopefully point you in the right direction of others that might better provide assistance if I can't do it directly myself. Yes, good, all right. And then um, there are a lot of organisations that are the, the code and all the different guides touch lots of different parts and of the research system in Australia. Um, what ARDC is trying to do here is build up a, a community of practice, if you like, of the people and uh, responsible for the implementation of the, the data components uh, of the code and, and its guide. Um, we've got these two uh, workshops that we've planned. Uh, I'll again, just reiterate that uh, for tomorrow for universities and in one week for medical research institutes. Uh, Keith is putting a, a link in there if you haven't uh, quite registered for that yet. The registrations are still open, so you can participate. I would strongly recommend you do, and other people at your organisation can come in. The idea here is that you know, we can learn from each other and consider as a group you know, some of those shades of grey and um, really help ourselves to uh, implement this really nice code and the, the, the policy framework. Uh, so ARDC will continue to with the, think of these for two workshops as, the, as a start here and uh, we have a lot of communities of practice to support data management and institutional responsibilities as well as researcher responsibilities. So we're very keen to um, contribute and to keep doing that if anyone has any suggestions for us and how we can uh, help to support the the help to support the sector helping itself, uh, then don't hesitate to contact us as well. So I think we've come to the end of our time. Um, look forward to working with you tomorrow on some of the problem solving around how to do this. Again, thanks very much to Justin and thanks very much to the uh, very active audience that's really helped with uh, the questions and answers. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>